Hey everybody, thanks so much for joining us today. We are in the Selenon, also known as SEP and one care session today. Um, first, before we introduce our panelists. Uh, hey, Dr. Ferrero, um, glad you could join us. Um, before we uh, introduce our panelists today, I'm gonna read a quick disclaimer statement so that we're all on the same page. All right, here we go. <clears throat> The information and opinions shared by our panelists will be generalized statements and are not intended to be interpreted as a medical consultation or a substitution for medical care. Please consult your local healthcare providers regarding any specific health-related concerns. This session is being recorded and will be shared on our public YouTube channel after the conference portal closes on August 31st. We also uh, will be available for viewing within the conference portal in the next few days. Alrighty. Stop share. All right, so now let's get to introductions. Dr. Meyer, would you like to start? Sure, I'm Hank Meyer. I'm a pediatric pulmonologist from Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and have had a longstanding interest and opportunity to help in the respiratory management of patients with a variety of different neuromuscular conditions of which I have a, a very uh, nice uh, set of uh, Selenon patients. Excellent, Megan. Hi, I'm Megan Leach. I'm a pediatric neuromuscular um, nurse practitioner at Oregon Health and Science University, Dornbecker Children's Hospital, and Shriners Hospital for Children, Portland. And I've been um, practicing neuromuscular um, care for oh, about 15 years now. Great. Dr. Dasager? Hi, I'm Naz Daskier. Um, I see some familiar names here from prior conferences. Very happy to see everybody. Um, I'm a pediatric neuromuscular specialist. I currently work at Goryeb Children's Hospital in New Jersey um, and have fallen in love with the Selenon community from my first meeting of them and have um, a few patients in my current practice. Great. Dr. Ferro. Your, your name says Clara, by the way, if you case. Are you able to unmute yourself? There we go. Yep. So I'm a neuromuscular neurologist and scientist, and the uh, well, cellular protein and related myopathy is very close to my heart because I had the chance of working with, uh, together with Pesat Mogada Sati, the first case of the disease, and I've been working on it since then. It's already 20 years ago. And uh, as a clinician, I care for uh, children and adults with uh, selenoprotein and related myopathy and had the chance of seeing and caring for um, roughly half the patients in uh, France. Um, mostly the neurological related aspects, but of course we're also involved with the multidisciplinary care with pulmonologists, orthopedic specialists and so on. Great, thank you. <clears throat> so the first thing I would like to cover today is kind of um, when thinking about the plenary session that we had on clinical trial readiness, <clears throat> I would love to hear kind of a brief comment from each of you um, how that specific topic relates to Selenon. Uh, Megan, do you want to start? Sure. So um, as was discussed in the clinical trial readiness um, session, it's really important that we make sure that we are all um, recommending and practicing and then our families are doing the best to your ability to, to follow our recommendations for just standard of care. We know that there's a lot of things um, that we can't control um, and so when we're taking care of our patients, when you're taking care of yourselves and your children, um, it's really important that we practice the standard of care so that we're at the, the best health in order to participate in clinical trials and be prepared for an intervention that may come. Great, Dr. Ferrero. Um, well, about clinical trial readiness, I think there's been, although uh, things never go so quickly as we would like, there's been major steps in the last year with the publication of two almost simultaneous clinical hist uh, natural history studies, one by my group uh, and um, um, 
European collaboration, international collaboration, and another one in which um, our colleagues from the UK and also Dr. Beck's, uh, the Alan Beck's group were involved. And these uh, natural history studies have given us numbers to put on how the disease evolves in the absence of treatment. So this is very important because whenever we want to test the treatment, we need to have parameters to measure to prove that it makes a positive difference compared to the natural evolution of the disease. So this is very encouraging. The other bad and good news at the same time is that as many of you know, we uh, did already some years ago a small pilot clinical trial with cellular protein and related myopathy patients. And sadly, the analysis of the results of this pilot trial were um, hindered by the pandemic situation because all the clinical research teams with whom we were working for this analysis, the statisticians and so on were taken very much taken by um, COVID trials. And so we had to stop the analysis of it. The good news is that we could start again this year. And now we have the final results in our hands. And I think this will be important, whatever the results of um, the impact of the drug that we were testing, which was an acetylcysteine, also because it will give us some numbers, not only on clinical parameters and strength and respiratory force and so on, but also on, um, on um, sorry, my, my, I forgot to mute my phone. Also on uh, parameters that we can measure on blood samples. And this is very important because uh, these biochemical alterations or in patients compared to controls are something that we can measure uh, by blood tests and that we can use to measure and follow up, up the impact of treatment and see which treatments can rescue these alterations and bring them back closer to what we see in people without a muscle disease. So I think these are um, things that bring the whole community closer to uh, clinical trial readiness in this rare I, I don't like to say ultra rare because the pro it's probably under recognized, but relatively rare condition. Sorry, I think I muted myself. Dr. Dessier, go ahead. Oh, sure. Um, so I basically would echo um, exactly from my perspective, like what um, Megan was mentioning before about just kind of sticking with standard of care. And I know that um, from prior meetings that we had, some people were already taking supplements as well. So keeping track of what supplements you might be using or the dose that you've been using um, would be helpful. Um, and also, you know, seeing that you know, this type of situation, this type of meeting is happening, I think is very helpful to put everybody's minds together and collaborate and work on future directions and um, therapeutic options. Great. Dr. Meyer, how does this apply to pulmonary? Well, I think offering objective outcome measures, and this is certainly a condition that sort of violates some of the standard principles of progressive neuromuscular condition, where you see a fairly uh, per, uh, steady decline and um, a non-ventilatory parameters such as airway clearance, ambulation, uh, and uh, you know, ability to um, uh, successfully manage an acute illness before having ventilatory difficulty. Whereas in, in this condition, we tend to see it uh, on the earlier side. Um, and so uh, sort of recognizing that and then leaning uh, uh, on the uh, pulmonologist to have an objective way of an easy way of measuring that uh, beyond um, uh, sleep studies uh, is something that I think presents some challenges, but uh, challenges that I think we're, we're close to being able to, you know, to manage. Great. Okay. Dr. Mary, I think you have some slides to share with us. Sure. Um, okay. So what I'd like to do is just briefly go through um, sort of general pulmonary issues that we see in patients with any neuromuscular condition. As I just mentioned, the, the standard um, uh, development of respiratory difficulty in uh, Selenon is a little different than what we see in a standard 
um, uh, standard neuromuscular condition. Uh, having said that, everything starts with respiratory muscle weakness. Um, and uh, through progression, we get to the end point, which is respiratory failure. However, there are a number of different pathways along the way um, towards that. Uh, there are three main ones. I look at uh, the primary respiratory muscle, which is the diaphragm. Uh, weakness of that clearly is a, is a you know a huge um, has huge downstream impact. And then the support structure, the chest wall. Chest wall muscle weakness is uh, hugely important. is very prominent in other uh, conditions, such as um, uh, in terms of weakness and 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 spinal muscular atrophy. And in this particular condition, and some other congenital muscular dystrophies, we see the opposite of chest wall muscle stiffness. Um, and then spinal instability due to uh, core muscle weakness can lead to um, other, other issues that can impact breathing. They all interact together. Um, and so if you look over to the left, diaphragm weakness and chest wall muscle weakness together can conspire to produce poor airway clearance, which puts a patient at risk of lower respiratory tract infections such as pneumonias which can then lead to both increased respiratory load because of airway inflammation and airway debris such as mucus, and then diaphragm weakness, which occurs during any, or general muscle weakness, which occurs uh, during any um, acute uh, uh, infectious disease. And then if we look uh, at the interplay between chest wall muscle weakness and spinal instability, as the chest wall becomes stiff due to muscle um, sorry, disuse and atrophy, um, uh, the spine uh, being weak can also lead to tipping both forward, causing kyphosis, or tipping from side to side, which causes scoliosis. And the chest wall muscle stiffness that occurs with progressive loss of muscle function and, and uh, uh, replacement of scar tissue on top of kyphoscoliosis can lead to what we call restrictive respiratory disease or low lung volumes. Low lung volumes lead to small airways, which are harder to breathe through and cause increased respiratory load. Then summing everything together, what determines whether you have respiratory failure or not is whether the diaphragm fatigue is uh, significant enough so that the diaphragm can't contract effectively enough to meet the respiratory load. And when that doesn't happen effectively, then you have respiratory failure. There are a number of uh, interventions clinically that we have. Uh, the first um, uh, is uh, supporting airway clearance, and we'll talk about that in a few slides. Then um, our orthopedic colleagues can provide external support with bracing in some situations um, or leading to um, uh, other uh, 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 interventions such as uh, um, uh, surgery to support the, both the spine and chest wall. And of course, once respiratory failure occurs, we have a variety of different ways of supporting that with ventilatory assistance. And then perhaps the most exciting thing is way upstream is some of the exciting work that's being done looking at ways of trying to preserve muscle function. So let's talk about airway clearance. And as we do that, we need to recognize what's involved in airway clearance. So what's a normal cough? Normal cough involves three distinct phases. The first um, clearly is taking a big deep breath in and filling the lungs up completely. Um, and then almost immediately after that, uh, doing a forced exhalation. Um, and then during the first quarter second of that, that exhalation is against a closed glottis, closed vocal cords. That happens subconsciously um, and requires, of course, intact uh, vocal cord function. The vocal cords then um, release after pressure has built up behind them. And then it's like removing your fingers from a balloon that you've just inflated. You have an explosive flow of air up the respiratory tract that will take um, any debris uh, in the airways um, up with it to then be able to expectorate from the more central airways. There are a number of ways that we can compensate for airway clearance insufficiency. The first is doing inspiratory assistance. So helping a patient breathe in more deeply. The second is helping with exhalations, uh, you know, providing uh, compression on, along the chest um, and abdomen together or uh, helping with suction. And then you can also do these uh, together. There are devices that can uh, do that. And then there are some other accessory measures for assisted airway clearance, both pharmacologically to help with um, thinning mucus, and then some other mechanical devices that we sometimes will add on on top of 
uh, the standard inspiratory and expiratory assistance. These are three different mechanisms for doing inspiratory assistance. At the bottom left is what we call a, um, um, it's a, um, a mask set up for doing uh, breast stacking where uh, the mask goes over the mouth and nose and then to the right of that circuit where the red line is, a patient can breathe in through a one-way valve. And then the left part of the circuit is a pop-off valve that's set at a fairly high pressure so that the patient breathes out and uh, tries to breathe out and the um, uh, air doesn't come out. And so what happens instead is that the patient is coached to take a series of deep breaths until they can't breathe in any deeper. Um, and then the mask is removed after the patient's breathed up to as high a lung volume as possible. And then they forcefully exhale as well as they can to um, uh, help clear the lower airways. The device at the bottom right is the Alpha 200, which is a device that's commonly used in, um, in, in France and some other European countries. And that device applies a positive pressure in what we call intermittent positive pressure breaths or IPPB. And that helps patients breathe in deeply um, through uh, that uh, blue circuit there, which uh, the patient, um, uh, in which the patient puts a mouthpiece uh, in their mouth. After they get the breath, the mouthpiece is removed and the patient breathes out. Uh, the device in the middle towards the top is the cough assist or mechanical insufflator exufflator. And this device can be uh, programmed to provide a, an inspiratory breath um, at a uh, level that the patient tolerates to be able to take a deep breath and then they can forcefully exhale. We can do both inspiratory and expiratory assistance with the cough assist um, by programming in a pressure that's applied to the patient so they can breathe in deeply, <clears throat> excuse me, and then they, uh, the pressure is applied for uh, two to three seconds and then the patient is shifted to uh, having negative pressure or suction applied, which helps them breathe out fully. These pressures um, are uh, selected based on having an experienced therapist work with the patient to find what pressures are both effective in doing deep breathing and then doing a forced expiratory maneuver and also more importantly are tolerated. Um, and so it can't very well be done just by filling out a prescription and sending it to a, uh, a medical equipment company. It really needs to be done, uh, uh, the training needs to be done in person. Um, want to shift to mechanical ventilation. There are two main components. The first is the interface, and it's probably, and I think in my, my view, the most important interface. That's how the air gets into the patient. For nighttime support, um, especially in, in Selenon, um, we use a nasal mask, um, uh, either over the nose or a cannula interface, which is nice and fairly uh, form-fitting um, and can seal uh, well over the nose. During the day, patients can use an, uh, a mouthpiece uh, for mouthpiece or sip or sip and puff ventilation, depending on what term you use. Um, more acutely, or if a patient is unable to keep his or her mouth closed at night uh, to tolerate the inspiratory breath, um, uh, you can use a mask that goes over the mouth and nose, an oral nasal mask. There also are also invasive options such as tracheostomy tubes um, and obviously endotracheal tubes, which are used in acute respiratory failure. And there still are uh, mechanisms for doing full body or negative pressure ventilation using a modern version of the iron lung or uh, something that we call a chest shell, um, which literally looks like a turtle shell that the patient um, uh, fixes to their chest and they can uh, ventilate um, uh, through that mechanism. The ventilator itself, there are two main types. One delivers pressure, the other delivers volume, uh, like a syringe. The pressure ventilator is the only way of ventilating non-invasively. Um, uh, and that's because of that, that is uh, by far the most commonly used outside of the hospital. So there are a number of different interfaces that we can use that fit over the nose um, with uh, silicone interfaces or gel-filled interfaces. And as of about four or five years ago, this was sort of the, uh, you know, what was available that we could use in pediatrics, though more recently, there are masks that are now made specifically for pediatric size and shaped noses, um, such as this one with a very happy looking child um, tolerating it. Um, uh, but uh, suffice it to say, the, the interface itself and tolerating the interface will be either make or break the um, um, uh, ventilation even more than 
the, um, in my opinion, than than you than what the specific pressures are that uh, the patient uses. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are other interfaces. These are oral nasal masks, uh, at least uh, over on the left, that's an oral nasal mask. The mask on the right, which looks like an avatar mask is a full face mask going over the mouth, nose and eyes. And surprisingly, some patients actually tolerate this quite well. Um, it really is based on patient preference. And the most important thing is a comfortable seal um, and uh, which allows the patient to tolerate it well. Um, this is a mechanism for doing mouthpiece ventilation. Um, uh, the mouthpiece is up at the top of the image and the tubing or the circuit goes through an articulating arm which can be affixed to a wheelchair, a table, a chair, a desk, um, or really any uh, object that is stable that can be positioned next to the patient. Um, and then what they're able to do is either keep the mouthpiece right next to their mouth uh, and then um, uh, seal their lips around it and start taking a breath. Um, or they can, some patients actually just keep the, the circuit um, in their mouth. Or if there's a um, patient has um, use of their upper extremities, they can uh, uh, use a regular uh, tube circuit and have the mouthpiece in their lap and then they can raise it to their mouth when they need to use it. Um, there are two main types of ventilators. These two ventilators are made for both nighttime and daytime use. There are ventilators that are just made for nighttime use that have um, pumps that are, or motors that are only made for partial, uh, partial use, not continuous use. The issue is that if you use a ventilator that's just made for nighttime use, in time it will burn out and fail. And so um, it's important either to have two nighttime partial use ventilators uh, to uh, rotate through or have a continuous uh, use ventilator like these two ventilators uh, if there's need for both daytime and nighttime use. Um, I wanna briefly talk about um, clinical progression. As I mentioned, uh, Selenon sort of violates a lot of these principles, but I uh, just wanna go through the typical um, um, uh, progression that, that we see in a generic neuromuscular condition. And, uh, the background for this is data from the Synergy Duchenne Natural History Study showing a progressive decline in lung function. And so clinically what we'll see is patients begin to have respiratory difficulty with um, respiratory illnesses that still can be managed as an outpatient. Perhaps an illness that goes from a seven day cold to a uh, two to three week cold. Um, and then uh, that leads to requiring more substantial inpatient care. Um, and then once the vital capacity drops uh, below 50%, we start to worry about nighttime respiratory failure, nocturnal hypoventilation. And when the lung function gets down towards the 30s, we worry about daytime or diurnal hypoventilation. And clearly there are a number of different interfaces that can, I'm sorry, interventions that can be offered at each stage. And obviously if you're beginning to have prolonged respiratory illnesses using a mechanical anexoplator or other airway clearance device is absolutely critical, um, uh, either as needed or daily. Um, and certainly daily use uh, is more, uh, you know, is um, really, you know, quite important as uh, disease progresses. When we get into the phase of disease where we are worried about nocturnal hypoventilation, uh, we like to get a sleep study to evaluate whether that's in fact the case. And if it is, then to arrange for initiating nighttime ventilation initially, and then when there are symptoms during the day evidenced by having um, a high uh, carbon dioxide value while awake, then we do mouthpiece or daytime ventilation. So I just wanna finish with this slide, just pointing out some, uh, what I consider important points that need to be uh, um, paid attention to and managed. And, and I think the most important thing is recognizing when something's changing. Um, There's some conditions where we don't have uh, useful outcome measures like the data I showed in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, either in patients who are um, uh, uh, too young to do um, uh, lung function testing or simply unable to. And so recognizing that there's a change and a deterioration that's out of character with the past trajectory is important. And then recognizing when there's an acute change that could indicate an acute illness. And that is important because when patients have muscle weakness, they don't show the respiratory muscle weakness. They don't show the typical sign that we all show when we get sick, which is that we start coughing when we get sick. 
And that's for a very good reason. It's because we have mucus or debris in the airways that's starting to form because of the infection that needs to be cleared. And if a patient can't cough effectively during the early stage of a condition, then it can make the condition much worse and last a lot, an awful lot longer. And so having both a airway clearance device like the cough assist, or if the patient is close to or uh, uh, has uh, respiratory insufficiency, having um, non-invasive ventilation. And then the final point I just wanna make is that I think one of the biggest and most emotional concerns and discussions that um, occurs is around using a tracheostomy tube. And at least without having a primary underlying airway issue, which could mandate having an artificial airway, there, to me, there is really no absolute indication for a tracheostomy tube. And I really see it as more of a quality of life issue that can be mitigated in part by having aggressive um, airway clearance uh, um, uh, intervention and then having um, nasal or oral ventilation, which can be used together. So. I'll stop there and see what questions there might be, and I'll um, stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Dr. Meyer. <clears throat> uh, do any of your colleagues have anything to add to that? Um, we have about 10 minutes, so we have a couple of extra questions, but I wanna make sure that we cover pulmonary because that's very critical in Solanon. <clears throat> we all good? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Meyer. <clears throat> Um, I wanted to ask a question about um, physical therapy. Um, we know that physical therapy is recommended um, in CMD in general, but are there any recommendations for physical therapy that are specific to Selenon? Is it And also, um, do we have evidence on whether doing physical therapy delays progression and is eccentric exercise uh, recommended for people with CMV. So Dr. Ferrer, let's start with you. You're muted. Okay. Dr. Dester, let's start with you while we figure out. It's okay, oh, okay. sorry. Never mind, there we go. I just couldn't unmute myself. No worries. With your hands. Um, so I'll start by the last part. Eccentric exercise is something we do not recommend in any form of congenital myopathy or congenital muscular dystrophy, and particularly in this one, because it has been seen that when we submit a healthy person to eccentric exercise, they, they develop mini cores in their muscles, which are pretty similar to the lesions that we observe in muscle biopsies from patients with selenoprotein and deficiency. So we do not recommend eccentric exercise. We recommend aerobic exercise for entertaining uh, muscle functioning, and particularly what we call endurance exercise, aerobic exercise, which is aimed to develop the ability of the muscles to produce and use energy that allows to su sustain an effort of moderate intensity. As for the usefulness of physiotherapy, yes, definitely. I don't think we have. So there has been no study assessing with figures the impact of different protocols of exercise in these diseases, like in most diseases. But we have evidence on clinical practice that when patients stop uh, moving or have to uh, reduce their physical activity for any reason, even if it's for a long trip when they use more wheelchairs for visiting places, then they lose functional capacities and this loss of functional capacity is reversible with physiotherapy again. So uh, it's not good in this disease, and this is probably true in many muscle conditions, but in this disease, it's particularly obvious. Um, absence of physical activity reduces uh, the functional capacities. And on the other hand, proper physiotherapy, which takes into account the breathing limitations and the endurance limitations uh, brings benefit. And this includes, of course, uh, respiratory therapy. Great, thank you. Dr. Dessiger, did you have anything to add? 
No, oh, that that's um exa you know exactly what I've learned and um, recommend as well. I guess the only other thing I sometimes suggest is obviously um, you know adding swimming. You know, um, thankfully the majority of the Selenon patients I have in my practice are pretty good enough in function to even just join regular swimming classes. They don't have to necessarily even get aqua therapy, but because it's anti gravity, they get good range of motion. And just kind of doing any kind of stretching exercises that you can sometimes get with yoga as well is helpful. Awesome, thank you. Okay. And in addition to um, the like, it's really hard to strengthen neck muscles in general. But as das as Dr. Daskier is mentioning, the pool you can like it's a great way to do neck strengthening exercises in the pool, and um, we and we love the pool for respiratory health and all of the all of the extra benefits. But the pool is an amazing place to do some exercises to help maintain that muscle mass. Great. We have a question in the chat kind of related to neck strength. Um, one of the, our patients is having, being recommended um, to wear a neck brace for the neck, to, for the neck weakness. Is that something you would recommend in a 21, 21 month old? Any of you? For me, I would say to wear a neck brace in places where we need to ensure that there's stability for safety reasons, like if you're in a car, um, because if you're in the car and you don't have the neck control, then that could be um, dangerous in an accident or when you stop suddenly. Um, but we also have to balance the risk of developing atrophy from not using the muscles. And so I think that it's very personalized, but there's a very Dr. Ferro, anything to add? Uh, not about this specific question, no, but I see on the chat that someone uh, wants to know a bit more about what constitutes eccentric exercise. So maybe yep. Megan, you can answer to that better than I do, but we don't uh, like weight lifting, for instance. This is an example of eccentric exercise or going downhill, running downhill. So anything where your muscle is contracting while it's relaxing um, are the types of exercises that we say are bad um, or, well, not, um, not recommended. And so when I try to think about these things in general, I think about anything that a, a football player would be recommended to do in training is probably not a good idea. But it's also things like if you're doing a push-up as you're lowering yourself down, um, your muscle is contracting so that you don't fall on your face. And so that's an exercise that's not recommended. Or um, if you're doing lots of squats, again, your muscle is contracting while, while lowering yourself to the ground so you don't drop. So um, those types of things um, or high, high weights, um, those are the type of eccentric activities that we would want to avoid. Does that make right. sense? I think so. Yep, weightlifting is, is the issue. Can we do small weights, for instance, you know, um, to try and build a little bit of muscle carefully, right? If, if at oh, all. So if you're like, pick this up, oh, oh, my drink. Okay, pick something up and then drop it or have somebody take it out of your hand, then you're not gonna, don't drop weights. But like, so when you're the not- The lift gonna, is okay, but putting it back is the problem. Theoretically, but there's no clinical trials looking at this. So we can say what we think, um, but, but we can't say that that's specifically a good idea, but high weight or high rate, high reps, low weight, um, or using, um, the water, yeah. the pool. So it's great. The, one, the one thing I sometimes say is, you know, it, like a bicep curl becomes eccentric. If you start with the weight out here with the bicep stretched with the weight here and you're like, well, like that. But once you get to 90 degrees where the bicep isn't stretched, you could do this. That's not eccentric. So if you did have like a small weight and you wanted to start at the 90 degrees, that wouldn't be necessarily an eccentric contraction. Okay. I find that the, an easy way a rule of thumb can be uh, low intensity, uh, but that allows for uh, a lengthy effort. I mean, something that you can do in a way that is not strenuous so that you can build up on the length 
of the, the duration of the effort and this allows the uh, powerhouses of your cells that are the mitochondria that are affected in this disease to be triggered to function and to use their abilities so that they provide more fuel for sustaining the effort in the long term. So I would say a mild effort that you can work towards sustaining in the long term. Great. Okay. We have one more question um, uh, that came through earlier. Um, Ronnie, we can talk about that. We can talk about stretches at a later. So if you want to email me, um, we can we can have more specific conversation. I want to talk about the relationship between muscle weakness and incontinence or kind of the feeling of urgency to urinate after being particularly active in the subtype. Um, and is incontinence in adults with Selenon common? And what can we do? Yes, in adults and in children. Okay. And this can be a major problem in schools. And we've had, I've had adult patients who've never forgotten the trouble they got into at school because nobody could explain the urgencies that um, they had. So yes, this is related with weakness of muscles of the pelvic floor, including the muscles that close the exit um, of uh, urine. And it can be improved to some extent with uh, pelvic floor uh, physiotherapy. Great. Anybody else have anything to add to that? So we have one question. Can overactive bladder medications like sulfacin help? Would you recommend those? They haven't been tested uh, okay. as far as I know, but the problem here is not overactive bladder. It's not the bladder itself, it's uh, the pelvic muscles, the, so the floor of the pelvic muscle, the, of the pelvic cavity that is not locking uh, and closing the exit ways for urine. So uh, again, I might be wrong because there's no trials doing this, but I don't think this can be as effective as physiotherapy to reinforce uh, the pelvic floor muscles. Great. Okay. So we're coming to the end of our time. Um, Dr. Dester, could you give us kind of a, a wrap up overview of kind of the future that we can look forward to and the great things that are happening kind of in general? A forward-looking statement, if you will. A forward-looking statement? Well, I think we have a tremendous patient population and amazing doctors like Dr. Ferrero and Dr. Beggs and Dr. Meyer and everybody. And obviously, Megan's very committed as well. And um, everybody's really committed to kind of developing, um, you know, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to Dr. Ferrero's results on the N-acetylcysteine trial, but also like keeping our eyes open for the future and other possible drug developments to treat this condition. And I think, um, therapeutics is like exploding right now and kind of sky's the limit. So I would stay optimistic, st stay your course, but also stay very optimistic about the future. Awesome. Thank you all. I appreciate your time today. Um, and again, if we didn't get to your question, please email us at scifam at curesmd.org and we'll do our best to help. So thanks so much panelists and I hope you all have a great day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks everybody.